Okay, we're live. Yeah. Okay, folks, we're finally ready to go. So, uh, welcome to the very last edition of the Karma Colloquium for this quarter. We're going to do better at announcing future colloquiums starting next year. We heard your voices about that, so. Um, but today we have a very special guest, uh, Dave Smith from Dave Smith Instruments. His uh, background is not any new news to anyone in here, but I'll just hit the highlights. Founder of Sequential Circuits, inventor of the Prophet 5 and 12, and as a major player in the MIDI spec and coined the term itself. No, no, we should thank you for that or not. <laughs> <laughs> Seminal work in R&D groups for both Yamaha and Korg, and founded Dave Smith Instruments uh, currently in North Beach, which features the Evolver, the MoFo, Prophet 12, Tempest Drum Machine, co-designed with Roger Lynn. He also has a family cat named Minky, otherwise known as the Prophet. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, it's, it's great to be back here. I've told a couple people. I used to come here once in a while back in the uh, late 80s and uh, early 90s, and then all of a sudden I, I think it was probably when I started doing hardware again, and haven't been back since, so it's kind of fun to be back in the building. It's still got that great old vibe that it's always had, so thanks for inviting me. That's been, uh, it's great to be back. So uh, I just usually start rambling in these sort of things. I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about how, it's sort of interesting how musical instruments specifically synthesizers have gone from the original analog uh, modulars invented by Don Buchla and uh, Bob Moog back in the 60s and it drifted into digital and then it drifted into software and now it's drifted back to analog, which is uh, I, I think kind of an interesting uh, thing to happen. Now, when I talk, I, all the generalizations I use are more for what's happening in uh, what could be called the commercial world and I know that I'm a, an esteemed academic institution here, so it's kind of a different perspective on things. Uh, I'll say a lot of things about this was the first this and this was the first that. When I do that, I'm talking about what happened in, in the commercial market, you know, the first instrument that sold a thousand of these or something like that, because there's always something that happened first, uh, typically in a place like this, where uh, somebody comes up with an idea and, and builds one of something and then sometime later somebody reinvents the thing, but just, just as a, a definition in terms, I'm talking mostly about the commercial world. Um, so I'll probably tend to go through uh, historically, but uh, I encourage questions or interruptions or tangents, uh, anything that you uh, have a thought you wanna ask about, you know, just go for it, because uh, it's more fun that way usually. Um, so beyond that, I'll just start. Uh, I got into this, I had a, played in bands in high school and college, went to Berkeley, got a degree in electrical engineering and computer science, and this was in 1971. Uh, a year after graduating, I, a friend told me about this synthesizer in a little store in Santa Clara. So I went to check it out, and it was a Minimoog. Uh, so the next day, I went to the Lockheed Credit Union, because that's the only place engineers can get jobs back then. Uh, got a loan and went out and bought it, even though I didn't know what it did. But it was a perfect combination of music and electronics from what I could tell. And that's what sort of got me started on it. Um, and what's kind of cool is I still have the same mini mode. It was one of the first two or three hundred built, and it's in our offices in uh, San Francisco and North Beach. So if any of you happen to be wandering through and you want to see it, we actually got it working uh, uh, recently again. Uh, so it's pretty fun. Um, quick tangents. Um, anyhow, uh, I started building accessories to go with it, and then once I did that, I realized other people might also want similar uh, things, because if I wanted, maybe somebody else did. So I started sequential circuits in 1974 uh, to sell an analog sequencer that I had built. One of the old you know, 16 rows, or 16 columns of three knobs to control um, any sort of an analog synth. Uh, I think I sold four of those, so that was a raging success. But after that, this was like in 1974. In 1975, I designed a little digital sequencer and sold a few hundred of those, so that was getting a little bit better. But I was Doing this all uh, on spare time, you know, on nights and weekends, I had a day job. Fortunately, by then, Silicon Valley was becoming more of Silicon Valley. 
Uh, so I was able to get a job working at first at Signetics uh, in their microprocessor department, later at Diablo Systems, designing instruments that use uh, microprocessors. So I was very familiar with how they worked way back then. Um, so I got the idea in 1976-77 of building a, uh, a new synthesizer that would be uh, polyphonic and programmable. Before that, I'm sure you mostly, I mean, everybody kind of knows synthesizer stuff, I'm assuming, so um, I don't have to define terms. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, before that, everything was monophonic, mini Moogs, Odysseys, ARP 2600s, that was pretty much what you had. But right around then, a company called Solid State Music was coming out with a chipset of uh, analog circuits. They had an oscillator chip, a filter chip, a VCA chip, and uh, an envelope generator chip. So I knew that naturally, well, you could get a microprocessor and put a bunch of these chips in a product and fairly easily build a polyphonic programmable synth, which is kind of what everybody wanted it, <coughs> wanted whether they knew it or not. So I didn't start working on it initially because I thought it was so obvious that the big companies back then, namely Moog and ARP, had to have been doing the same thing because it was obvious. But sometimes, as we all know, the obvious things are used, <laughs> sometimes not so obvious. So in early, in the, I think probably around spring of 1977, I started what, working on the product that ended up being the Prophet 5. And we showed it at the 1978 NAMM show in uh, Anaheim. Uh, how many people have been to a NAMM show? Oh, cool. Uh, well, back then, the NAMM show was in the basement of the Disneyland Hotel, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, where it's gone since. Uh, what, quick tangent, back then, the big NAMM shows were in Chicago every summer, and it was huge. And that was because the music industry was pretty much, uh, it, was, it was all about pianos and organs and band instruments and all of that, and they're all based back then. So when they started this tiny little show in Anaheim, you know, it was just hardly anybody went. But we started right about then, and that's when technology just was getting in. And of course, over the next few years, we just saw this huge shift where eventually they just stopped the Chicago show. And now, as those of you have been, the Anaheim show is monstrous. It's huge. And that's because in, a lot, in no small degree, the West Coast has kind of took over the music industry as far as musical instruments go. So that was kind of a cool thing to have happen. Okay, end of tangent. Back to showing the Prophet 5. Barely worked. Uh, I hear stories of me showing up after working on it all night, and I don't remember. That's probably true. Uh, but it mostly worked through the show, and everybody loved it, and uh, we knew things were going to go well from that. So, of course, the Prophet 5 did take off. That year, we started shipping, uh, I think, probably April-ish. And out of the first 10 units, they were going to, you know, uh, Rick Wakeman, David Bowie, Joe Zavano, I mean, all these big names, because everybody had to have one. Because it was the first time you can go up to a synthesizer and do this, you know. Nobody had been able to do that before, and hit a button and change the sound. Uh, and it was kind of interesting, because I think, well, I know this for a fact now, looking back, that a lot of the people who bought those, the Prophet 5 then, really weren't interested in the instrument as a synthesizer. Uh, they weren't necessarily synthesis by any means, but it was the first time you can go from strings to brass to bass to flute to whatever by hitting a button. And that's what everybody really wanted. And that was the first thing that allowed them to do that. So over the next couple of years, of course, other companies figured it out, and uh, we had competition from Oberheim and Roland and Yamaha and all that. So, but everybody was doing pretty much the same thing, uh, basically computer-controlled, microprocessor-controlled uh, analog synthesizers, because that was the best technology. What we didn't know at the time was actually sounded better than a lot of digital things, too. Uh, I could probably get some arguments in this room about that. Uh, <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> So the next thing that happened, going chronologically again, is that uh, once you have a microprocessor and an instrument, the first, one of the first things you realize is, well, it's really easy for this to communicate to another instrument, you know, and digital communication, piece of cake. So all the companies, we all started building accessories <coughs> and developed these interfaces to have our instruments talk to one another. Uh, sequential, we had a, a high-speed serial bus. It was actually like 30 times faster than MIDI, I think. Uh, Roland had a DCB bus, uh, Yamaha had something, uh, uh, 
Uh, Oberheim's was fun because he actually sent the whole Z80 bus out in a ribbon cable. So this was before FCC regulations. It probably shut down, <laughs> shut down every TV within a three door radius. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, obviously, our Sequential's interface wouldn't work with Roland's interface, which wouldn't work with Yamaha's interface. So we started talking at NAM shows, saying, well, you know, we probably really should do something about this and fix it, or if we want the industry to get anywhere. And that's where I kind of got a little aggressive, and we at Sequential wrote an interface that we called the Universal Synthesizer Interface, USI. And I gave a paper at the 1981 October New York AES convention, uh, presenting the USI and saying, here's an interface, it, we need to do something, who wants to get involved? It doesn't have to be this, I don't really care, here's a starting point, but you know, we need to do something. So I followed up with that in the January NAM show in uh, Anaheim, which was by now a whole lot bigger than it was in 1978, even though it was only like three years later. Uh, and the same thing, I, I, I actually had a meeting and invited everybody who made any sort of keyboards and synthesizers to come, and uh, just about everybody did come from what I remember. And so I started off the same way. I said, here's an interface, USI, we need to do something, this can be it, we can do something else, who wants to get involved? And that was uh, kind of interesting because not everybody wanted to get involved. Uh, some uh, definitely did not want to get involved. There's a combination of things. Some people... Tell us. Tell us? <laughs> Tell you? <laughs> well, <laughs> the, uh, there were two or three different things going on. Some people wanted, even back then, wanted high-speed, digital, parallel, uh, interfaces that just would have been impractical cost-wise and development-wise. Other people, you know, rightfully so, wanted to do a wait and see and just, you know, they just weren't ready to jump in right then. And then, of course, there was a lot of not invented here, you know, well, I'm not going to do that, it's stupid, you know, so. Uh, and I couldn't tell you who did what specifically, naming names. But what happened after that meeting, I was somewhat dejected because I thought, well, this is going nowhere. Uh, but I was approached by Roland, and they said, well, you know, we still want to do this, and uh, so does Korg and Kauai and Yamaha. So I said, cool, let's do it. And we met in one of their booths and sat down, and that was, you know, the official start of the collaboration of what eventually became MIDI. So uh, throughout 80, we're in 82 now, uh, we just worked on it. I went to Japan a couple times, and they visited uh, here a couple times, but of course, the other companies were all Japanese and we were the only non-Japanese company, so it took some time and communications and <clears throat> trying to get all that worked out. But we mostly got uh, an interface designed and developed during that time, so that was cool. Um, and then we were still working with USI as a name, and I remember specifically this one day that uh, Kakahashi-san, who's the founder and then president of Roland, uh, a great guy if you haven't met him, a really smart guy, um, he was visiting uh, the sequential office with one of his people, and we were just talking about MIDI stuff, and the name came up, and they wanted to call it uh, the Universal Musical Instrument Interface, which made more sense, because musical instrument is more encompassing than synthesizer. Uh, and they thought he'd pronounce it you, me, and they thought that was kind of cool, because it was you and me, and a combination of a nice way to pronounce it, and we kind of thought that wasn't a great idea, but in the same meetings, I, I just, the, the name musical instrument, taking that part, digital interface, which is what it was, popped in my head, and everybody seemed to like it, so that's when the, that acronym actually started becoming the thing, the name. So, um, later that year, we were all developing instruments while we are doing this, which is kind of interesting because uh, we had to communicate with the other companies what we wanted to do without telling them why we wanted to do it. Uh, one specific thing was the uh, uh, multi timbral mode. We, wanted to, we knew we wanted to build multi timbral instruments because they, they weren't invented yet, again, in the commercial market. Uh, but we didn't want to tell them that we wanted it, so we had to kind of sneak around and, well, this is kind of mono mode, and this is sort of how it's supposed to work. And then that caused problems because Yamaha misinterpreted what mono mode meant. <coughs> And so after another year, we had to actually add a new mode just to cover the fact that there were misunderstandings there. <laughs> Anyhow, later that year, uh, I think it was, yeah, December of 82 is when we shipped the Prophet 600, which is the very first MIDI anything. 
uh, and then in January, a month later at NAM, everything happened in Anaheim, Anaheim NAM. Uh, Roland brought their Jupiter 6 over to our booth, and we got a MIDI cable, plugged the two together, and it worked. Yay! So that was the start of, of the whole thing. So that was you know over 30 years ago, 30, uh, 83, so it's already 31 years ago. Uh, the rest of the year was not quite that smooth because now we really had naysayers, uh, you know, people who just <laughs> refused to get involved and saying how stupid it was. And, it, and then there was the whole media is too slow thing. And what most people don't even realize now is the reason it was too slow was not MIDI itself. It was the all of our microprocessors were way overtaxed. We, of course, would use the cheapest Z80 we could find to get done whatever needed to get done. And some of them, you know, our, ours work fairly well, but there are some famous stories of, you know, you'd send out a MIDI command and sometime later the note would play. And it was not MIDI, because MIDI only takes a millisecond to send a note, so it had to be something else taking that extra 10 or 15 milliseconds. So it got a bad rap because of that initially. Uh, and it took a while for people to catch on, but I, I knew it was going to work because the five companies that were involved had a, a big percentage of the market, and when that happens, everybody kind of has to jump along. And, of course, the consumers loved it, you know, because all of a sudden, hey, I can plug a DX7 into a Profit 5, cool, uh, and get digital and analog with one keyboard. And so it just really uh, took off and ha hasn't looked back. I mean. I mention this all the time, you all know this, that MIDI is, what did I say, 33 years old and is still version 1.0. And, uh, and it's used everywhere, every day, all the time. And it does that because it was, it's simple to implement, it's really cheap to implement, and it does what 95% of the people need. Um, and, you know, you, you can't, can't lose in that case. So it'll be interesting, everybody asks me, what's, when's MIDI 2.0 who coming out? <laughs> Leave me out of it. I don't <laughs> there, it's, it's funny because people are trying. There are a number of initiatives out there, and they all have good points and bad points. But, you know, again, we gave MIDI away for free, uh, so there was a no cost, there was no royalties, there was no licensing fees, there was none of that. I sort of regret that now that it's been on a few billion cell phones. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe a tenth of a cent would have been nice. But, um, it, you know, we just wanted to make sure it worked, so that's why we gave it away, and I think it was still the right decision. But uh, somebody else can come out with MIDI 2.0. So going back into the shift of, of technology, the DX7, which everybody here should be very familiar with because it pretty much was birthed right here. No? Did, was that before? What? really good engineers. Yes, but they're really good once you give them an idea. <laughs> Anyhow, we all know the stories, but the DX7, you know, before that, you know, we'd sell five or ten thousand of an instrument, like Profit 5 sold, I think, six or seven thousand units, so they, it's not like we're, these, these were big companies. Of course, it cost $4,500 in 1978 dollars, which was enough to buy two new cars back then, so to give you a reference point, but just about everybody who bought the Profit 5 made money on it, too because they had the Profit 5, and, and if you're a musician and had one in the studios and so forth, you made money on it. So it, was, it worked for everybody. Um, but when the DX7 came out, everything kind of changed. Uh, all of a sudden, it was 16 voices, which was you know, more than twice as much as all the analog synths, because it was digital, and we all know how that scales. Uh, it had velocity on the keyboard, which none of the other, or I don't think any of the other ones did yet. Uh, some of them did, I guess, but not many. Uh, it was really lightweight, and mostly it sounded kind of like a Rhodes, and it didn't weigh 250 pounds. And I still think that's one of the main reasons it was so successful. Uh, but it was also, to a certain degree, the best uh, emulative sound at, at, at this time. It was a new sound, and you know, so instead of people buying five or 10,000 analog synths, they sold over 200,000 of them, which is kind of, and it was, you know, it had MIDI on it, so it was the first year MIDI was out. So it was just kind of a perfect storm of synthesis, but again, I don't think, well, it was too hard to program, so I know nobody programmed it, but most people still just wanted to change sounds and play the notes and have it sound like a Rhodes. Um, and all those other sounds that we heard on all the songs in the, you know, 83 to 85 time frame. So the next thing that happened is uh, when Chord came out with the uh, M1, 
And as you know, the M1 was a sampling keyboard, and that was really the first playback sampling keyboard that really put it all together in one instrument. It was 16 voices. Uh, it had fairly good samples and had effects and what they called it a workstation because it had you know a sequencer in it too, and that even the sales of that surpassed the uh, DX7 even. And to to date, I think the M1 is still the best-selling keyboard uh, synthesizer ever, and because it was by far the best emulative keyboard that was out there because it was real pianos and real strings, well, real, you know, real <laughs> they, they, they were recorded, but at the time it was a whole lot better. You can't do a good piano on an analog synth, I mean, that's not what they do. So on a sampler, even if it's, you know, old technology, it was basically uh, a piano and people flipped out. So it was very successful. The only problem was that ever since then, uh, Core Yamaha Roland keep building M1s. Uh, they're building more and more. They, every year they come out with a new M1. It's got more voices. It's got higher sample rate. It's got more ROM. It's got better recordings. And they're definitely getting better, but they're all pretty much an M1. And so that's kind of not all that interesting for somebody like me. And uh, I'm guessing some people in here too. Uh, I'm always a fan of coming up with new sounds and. Um, seeing what you can come up with, turning knobs, and that sort of thing. So during that time, let's see, that was right about, that kind of helped put the final nail in Sequential's coffin. Uh, we were officially bought by Yamaha in 88, maybe, uh, 87. Uh, but they kept us open for about a year and a half and then shut it down. And then uh, within a few weeks, Korg came in and, and wanted me to start up a an R&D group, uh, so I did, and that group is still in Milpitas, and they've been there. They, we designed the Wave Station, that was the first instrument we did, which was kind of a next step uh, Prophet VS, for those of you familiar with that instrument. Prophet VS is always a great story, because when we first built it, we started shipping them. Uh, it's kind of an unusual technology, because we have digital um, wave shapes in it, but they're really shitty. They, you know, they just alias, it's just linear interpolated 128 word wave tables that we just stretch all the way up and down. So of course when you go up, it just sounds horrible. But if you mix four of them together and run it through a chorus and unit, this, you get this wonderful combination, noisy thing that just sounds great. When we first came out with it, nobody wanted it. You know, we sold it for a year and then we finally dumped them all because nobody wanted it. Uh, and then a few, a few years later, all of a sudden, everybody wants them. And that just kind of shows how uh, the instruments, how fashionable it can be. Uh, it's like DX7's highly fashionable. The M1's when they first came out, highly fashionable. VS's when they came out, nobody wanted them. Two years later, highly fashionable. You just can't predict musical taste. But, you know, when a, a Trent Reznor or a Prince or somebody uses something and everybody goes, what is that? Uh, then all of a sudden other people start noticing. So the, the VS, there, there's really nothing that sounds like it. It doesn't have the widest sound palette. It can't do a whole lot of different things, but what it does is just an awesome sound. Um, little tangent on the VS. Um, so going back to the wave station, that was kind of a follow-up to the um, uh, wait, uh, to the VS. And after, I, I work, continued working with Korg for a little while and uh, it just wasn't working out for me. I was living here and I was actually had moved up to uh, St. Helena by then. Um, so after a few years, I just kind of drifted out of, of that. During that same time, I was coming here a lot, not a lot, but occasionally, and uh, I was starting to get interested in the physical modeling stuff that Julius was doing and others here. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and Chris walked in, so yeah. Um, so the next thing that happened <coughs> is, um, I got involved with a company called Sear Systems that's pretty close by here. Uh, and what we ended up doing for them was first we designed a, a software synth, a general MIDI software synth that ran on a 486 natively uh, under contract for Intel. Uh, and they didn't really do much with it, but uh, Andy Grove used it in a Comdex keynote speech and stuff like that. So it's just, they were getting, this is when they were just starting to get to the point where they were trying to come up with reasons for uh, people buying new computers so they needed stuff to eat up bandwidth and that was pretty easy to do back then. 
Uh, we then did a second generation soft synth that um, um, had a, um, let's see, I guess it was mostly uh, general MIDI, but we ended up licensing that to Creative Labs and then they put it on one of their sound cards. So they were able to double the voice count from 32 to 64 because half of them were hardware and half of them were in software. Uh, and in that one, I think we actually had some, uh, I don't know if it was Sondius yet. Uh, was it Sondius by then? We actually licensed some technology from here uh, for some of the physical models. We had two or three simple models in the software. Uh, and then we did the third, uh, third uh, version, which we called Reality, and I kind of called that the first professional software synthesizer that was ever done. And again, obviously there were other software synthesizers around, but I'm talking about in the marketplace. And it was kind of cool because it had uh, subtractive synthesis, it had sampling, it had FM, it had some physical models, it had all of this stuff in one piece of software. And it was kind of interesting when we first started showing it in, at the NAMM show, because people would walk up and say, well, what are you doing? And what, they said, well, we have the software synthesizer. And they go, well, what do you mean? And then you play them somebody and go, oh, that sounds cool, what is it? It's software, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, it's, in, it's just, it's software running a computer. What do you mean? I mean, <laughs> the concept of software making sounds like that was obviously completely foreign, because this was the first one, so. What year was that? Uh, this was, I think, 94, 95? Do you remember it? 95? Yeah. Um, so, it, it, was, it didn't take off all that much uh, initially. What I should have done, and we talked about it, but didn't want to do it, was make a software Profit 5, uh, which we, it turned out it let the Germans do that instead, because uh, there have been two or three of those so far. Uh, but that's how Native Instruments kind of got started, and, then, and they sold a whole lot more software Profit 5s than I sold Realities. Um, but that's the way it goes. Uh, I didn't, I've never been one to want to redo something I've already done that seems kind of pointless uh, and boring and all that. Um, so the next thing that happened was one day I realized I was never really playing with reality. and. <laughs> It was kind of weird because it sounded good and did all these cool things. In fact, back then we were kind of pompous and we were calling it the future of music synthesis. You know, software, you could do everything. Uh, and I started asking myself, well, why am I not playing with this thing? And I began to realize it's because I was doing this. Type, 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 click, click, drag, drag, click, click, drag, drag, click, click, type, 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 type play a couple notes. Go back over this, type, type, click, click. And it just wasn't any fun. I mean, it didn't feel like a musical instrument to me. It, there was no connection to it, there is no character, no personality. Even if it sounds good, even if it has great graphics, it, you know, I don't know if it's just old dog new trick or what, but I just, I just didn't like it. And around the same time, uh, a couple years later, I ended up helping Roger Lynn a tiny bit on his adrenaline project, and I started realizing again how fun hardware was, something that you could hold, something that is always going to be the same. If I turn this knob in 20 years, it'll do the same thing. I don't have to update my OS every year. I don't have to redo my OS. I don't have to port to this or that every year. I don't have to do any of that. Plus, I, like I say about hardware, it's the ultimate dongle. So uh, nobody's going to copy my hardware. So it's, it, everything about it just made more sense. So that's when I started my uh, most recent company, Dave Smith Instruments, in 2002. And my first product was a, a little desktop uh, synth I called the Evolver, and you know it was it was kind of fun. I was trying to do something new, so there's actually a DSP in there. So the uh, oscillators are digital. There's two digital oscillators, but two analog oscillators, and then the analog filtering, and then a lot of feedback paths. You know, like delay lines uh, that go through the analog filter, so you can actually do car plus strong uh, sounds with it and so forth, but with analog filters, which is kind of a cool sound, and a lot of things like that. But it was Hardware-wise, it was fairly simple because it had been 10 or 15 years since I had designed hardware, so I had to get used to the new tools and, and everything was surface mount now and just, you know, all of that stuff. So it was just kind of fun to get back into it. So that was the first step. And I also didn't want to have a big company, so I said, oh, I'm never going to have employees again. At least two people in here can laugh about that. Uh, but I just, uh, in the first five years, I guess, it was just me. So. You know, first it was the Evolver that I made, a uh, four-voice polyphonic version, and then with a the keyboard on it and lots of knobs. And, uh, so it kind of progressed. And then uh, it was kind of funny, at this one point, uh, 2007, 
I decided I could, well, I could probably build a fairly low cost all analog, uh, well, technically speaking, all analog signal path uh, polyphonic eight voice synth. And so I started working on it. And I, you know, it's fairly simple compared to the Evolver, but I thought, well, it might be kind of fun just to see what it turns out. And by the time I got it working, I said, wow, this thing sounds really good. It's all analog, <coughs> signal path, everything sounds great. And it was, after hearing it, I, that's when I decided to call it the Prophet 08, which came out in 19, uh, 2007, uh, just because I, 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 I didn't start by thinking I'm going to build another Prophet. I just wanted to build a polyphonic analog synth, but it, it was just kind of like an updated version of what the Prophet 5 would have been 30 years later, because it did come out almost exactly 30 years after the Prophet 5. So that was kind of fun. And what's really interesting now is we're still shipping as many Prophet 08s now as we have, you know, and it's been out for like six or seven years. Uh, I've learned that what happens if you come out with new instruments that are unique and different from your previous instruments, then every instrument you come out with gets added to your product line. Whereas the mindset when you're thinking about building workstations, or, you know, and sampling keyboards, every keyboard you come out with replaces the unit from last year. Uh, so you're, you know, it's hard to grow if you just keep building the same thing. So uh, most of our products have lifetimes, you know, that are really long. I'm st we're still building the original Volver from 2002, and that's you know, 12 years ago. So that's just something I'd like to keep in mind. So we started shipping the, the Evolver in 2002, uh, and that's also about the time Moog came back in and did the uh, Mini Moog Voyager. And so I think what happened over these next few years is people started rediscovering what analog sounded like, because it had been gone for so long. And this is e even more recently, I think a lot of kids who were brought up on software I mean, let's face it, software is basically free or, or very cheap, and it comes with your computer, so you, know, you start playing with something there, and if you get into it, these kids will actually start thinking, well, let's see, what's, what's the real thing sound like? Or they'll come across it and not even know there's a, a real thing. And when they actually sit down and play with a real instrument, especially an analog one, and with knobs and interaction, they get blown away. So all of that's been happening the last five years, and because of that, our business just keeps growing, uh, you know, it just keeps growing, it's been pretty awesome. So now we're actually up to 10 people. Uh, Andrew in the corner was the first person I hired back in 2007. He hasn't learned his lesson, because he worked for me at uh, Sear, and he worked at Sequential, I think, 79 did you start? Uh, yeah. And so, he's uh, my right-hand guy. Um, and Joanne is also back there. She was employee number two uh, in 2008, I think, probably. Uh, yes. So, anyhow, we, we've got a great group now, and I just keep, you know, we just keep things growing naturally on their own. We, you know, we still don't have reps in the field. We don't have distributors everywhere. Uh, we get new dealers, you know, word of mouth. We export, I don't know, 60% of our sales. Um, and you know, these days, fortunately, people can buy stuff over the internet, so you don't always have to be in a brick and mortar store. Though I wish we were in more so people could actually try them before they buy them. But um, so the whole analog thing has just gone apeshit the last few years. Nowadays, even software companies are building analog hardware. I mean, Arturia came out with a little non programmable uh, monophonic synth. But of course, you realize after a while that. Building a non-programmable monophonic synth is something that probably half the people in this room could do in a couple weeks. It's really not that hard because nothing has to match, nothing has to be programmed, nothing, you know, it's not, if you have more than one voice, the voices have to sound the same, but if you only have one that's just controlled by a knob, then it's just all relative and it just doesn't matter. So there are tons of, I, I, I probably should go out and count how many <laughs> there are now, but there are a whole lot of non-programmable, cheap, a lot of them are dirt cheap, and you know, they all sound good. That's the other cool thing, is every, everything sounds good these days. Um, so now, the other thing that's driving all this is there's been a big thing about vintage synths. Everybody wants an old synth, you know, even if, they even want the bad ones. Sometimes people come up and say, I've got one of these from Sequential, and they go, ooh. That was, that was one of the bad ones. I, I never say that, because that wouldn't be very nice, but uh, not, just because they're old and analog doesn't make them good. <laughs> Uh, in fact, the Prophet 600, back then, uh, 
There's a first product I think I did with a single Z80 and all the, so all the envelopes and LFOs were digital. And it was just way, I mean, it was just so slow and zippery and the whole thing was not good. It had some really good sounds. But what's curious is a guy, I think he's in France, just did a, a, a replacement uh, for the Z80. You take out the Z80 and you put in his new chip where he put in an arm or something, I don't know, some sort of real modern processor. And he went through and actually reverse engineered it. And now these, uh, the envelopes and everything are, are fast and snappy in the way they should be. So I haven't actually heard that, but it's kind of cool seeing what people are doing. Um, so uh, it's just get, getting really interesting seeing all these different things happening in the analog realm. Of course, part of it's just, you know, if you're a musician and you're being interviewed in a magazine, it sounds good to say, oh yeah, I've got this, you know, Prophet 5, I've got a Jupiter 8, ha ha ha. You know, it just sounds good in print. It looks good in the pictures to have a bunch of old stuff. And half the time I end up competing with stuff that I did 30 years ago. I'm trying to say, well, you know, this new stuff actually comes with a warranty. It's, 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 it's real analog. It's the same thing. It sounds different. You know, everybody says, well, it doesn't sound like a Prophet 5. Well, of course not. It's not a Prophet 5. You know, it's a different instrument. Even if, you know, it's the same basic filter that we used back then, the Curtis filters, but it sounds different. Uh, and that's good. I mean, if it sounded the same, like I said earlier, why bother doing it? Um, but that's, it's just kind of interesting to see that. So now people are realizing, oh, I could buy new ones that actually will, I could take on the road and then they won't break. Because people who have Profit 5 never take them anywhere. Because if you look at it too hard, they, you know, they, just think about it. You know, electronics are not made to survive for that long. Think of anything in your house, electronic, that's older than three years, four years. You know, try to keep an old synthesizer from 30 years ago alive. It's just not easy to do. So it's, it's just curious that people actually try. And it's good. I mean, they do still sound good and it's good to see them used and they're still being, you know, people still record with them. Um, though I'd rather have them buy the new ones because the old ones don't help me at all. Uh, anyhow, uh, the other thing that's happening is the modular synths are coming back. Uh, and a lot of that's, it's a combination of things. It's people wanting to buy little things and play with them and interconnect them. Uh, some of it's collectoritis, because oh, I can get some new modules every couple months and plug it in. And definitely it looks great on stage or in a photo. I mean, there's nothing that looks better than a modular with all those cables and all of that. So it's good seeing people do that too. Uh, it's not, you know, for me, I, it's too frustrating because when I get a sound, I want to push the save button and have it come back later. And that doesn't happen with modulars. Uh, some of them are partially programmable, but it's just uh, a different thing. But it's just, again, it's the analog sound. It's the randomness, the inaccuracies, the, the, all the weird stuff that comes with analog. You know, so while the old vintage uh, analog sensors still, you know, cost almost as much to buy a Profit 5 now as it did 30 years ago. But meanwhile, you want to buy a DX7, <laughs> no, you know, they're, they're all over the place and they don't cost much. You know, same with an M1. There's not much value to old digital instruments. Uh, part of what I think has actually happened is I think uh, analog, well, subtractive synthesis has actually passed the test of time. Uh, it's been around for over 50 years now. Uh, most digital synths pretty much just emulate subtractive analog synths. Uh, most software, that's mostly what it does. Again, talking commercially. Um, and there's something about it. It's, it's, it, you can connect with it. Everybody knows what's going to happen on any synth when you turn that cutoff knob or when you turn that resonance knob. You know what's going to happen. Sure, different flavors on different instruments, but you, you know what's going to happen. It's a sound. It's a sound people can relate to, and it's still a good sound. I mean, it still sounds really good to just do that, even though it's overused a lot. So I, I think. You know, we know DX7s and, uh, you know, FM ha has a great sound, but it's just hard to work with. Uh, sampling is just kind of static, so there's really no working with it. Uh, there are a lot of other types of synthesis out there that are interesting, but it's hard to condense them into a um, simple unit that you can just sit down and control easily. Or they may sound really good, but they only do this kind of sound, and they can't do that sort of sound. Uh, you know, again, that's why I was interested in software synthesis for a while, because it seemed like, oh, now I could do everything. We just updated and throw new programs in, and you could do all kinds of different sounds. But that just takes away from the 
instrument side of the instrument. I just, I like having something that's constrained and simple and always does the same thing and it's just hard to get that out of software. Well, it's impossible. You know, you could get a little controller to control your uh, software, but then you have to remember, well, you've got a row of 16 knobs and, okay, knob number four does this and knob number eight does this, but, you know, there's no, on our instruments, you've probably seen them, you know, everything's laid out in signal flow patterns, so it's very easy to dive to the oscillators, to the filters, the effects, whatever you want to do, it's all very simple. And um, I think that's part of, you know, making it fun to play the instrument. I, I always think that if you play one of my instruments and you don't either smile or laugh every few minutes, then I probably failed. And that's why I've never understood why they called the uh, sampling instruments workstations. Work, work. I don't want to work. I just want to play. It's all about playing. So it's preferences. Obviously, you know, if you're a keyboard player in a band, a covered band, or almost any band, you need a sample-based keyboard because you got to cover a lot of space. And so I, I understand that. And it gets back to what most people want is that because that's what they need. And then it's a different group that are interested in synthesizers and uh, synthesis. So. That's, that's who we cater to. We're fortunate now that it seems like nobody else wants to build polyphonic analog synths except us, uh, which makes it easier <laughs> to be successful in business when you don't have any competition. Uh, someday that'll change. Well, Electron, I guess, has a four-voice keyboard, a Swedish company, but you know, the other, it doesn't seem like a Moog or, uh, I, I don't, somebody's gonna do one someday. But so far they haven't. And meanwhile, you know, we just came out with the Prophet 12 a year ago. And I didn't know what was going to happen with that because it's a $3,000 instrument. And as you know, most people these days, you get new mindset, electronics, oh, well, next year it'll be cheaper and smaller and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So when you actually ramp it up to something that costs more than everything else, even though we think it's worth it, you just never know what the response is going to be. But so far it's been incredible. I mean, I've, we sold a ton of them and I, you know, you just don't know. So that, that's been fun. And then we have the Tempest drum machine that I co-designed with Roger Lynn. Uh, and that's already been out for two and a half years, I guess now. And you know, that's doing well. Again, our, our stuff tends to sell month after month fairly consistently. Uh, we don't have the big, you know, sell 10,000 and sell zero. Uh, so it's a lot easier <laughs> to deal with, a lot less headaches. Um, so let's see. So, Steve, uh, a year ago you uh, showed us your, your, your loft, uh -huh. and also we saw the manufacturing facility. And I think it would be really interesting to this group to know how that came about. Okay, yeah, that's, I, I usually make that point, thanks. Uh, all of our products are built in the city of San Francisco, which can't be said said for many other, I mean, in the music industry, almost everything is in China, pretty much. I mean, even Moog is starting to build their products in China, uh, which is too bad. But uh, we, well, when I started a company, again, the only way it would work is contracting out the manufacturer. <coughs> uh, you just can't, you know, I was not going to have a factory again. I mean, I knew that much. Fortunately, these days, you can actually work with different companies to get things built here. I mean, I always wish companies like Apple would do that with some of their trillions of dollars, but uh, there's no reason why you can't build it here. Uh, in our case, the contract manufacturer is on Sansom Street, about a 10 minute walk from our office in North Beach, so it's almost like having our own factory, because you know somebody's walking down there every other day, just for some reason or another. So we can keep track of our production, keep an eye on it, uh, work with them closer, which means we can move faster, because you know if we do things in China, well you gotta, You've got, first of all, you got to spend a lot of time in China. Uh, and the time you spend there is time that you're not developing. And we'd all rather develop because that's much more fun than producing. Uh, and then when they build it, you know, they build, you know, a couple thousand of them, put them on a boat, and then they come over and you hope that they're all okay. And, you know, but there's all these time lags anytime you want to do anything. And, you know, we could move much quicker. I mean, we have a very small development uh, uh, group. We've got Myself, I have one software guy and one hardware guy, and the three of us pretty much design everything. And we could still get products out faster than most companies. A lot of that is also because we don't have a bunch of salespeople telling us, oh, we got to build one of those, but half the price. 
and we don't have to do market studies to determine uh, this is really what we need to be building and we need to get into this space. We just kind of do whatever we want to that sounds like fun and, you know, something new and different. Like the, the Prophet 12 is a good example. We already had the Prophet 8. Uh, so the Prophet 12, we, you know, we didn't want to just build a 12-voice Prophet 8 because that would be kind of silly. Uh, so we came up with some uh, new ideas. One of the things we did is we put a digital front end in it. There's actually six sharks in the Prophet 12. And they're doing all, you know, all the envelopes and all the oscillators. We're doing some uh, pre analog effects and you know so all those effects can be done at audio rates and high quality and then it drops down into analog for the, the analog filters VCAs even analog distortions and stuff like that so digital front end analog after that so it's just it's kind of like the original Volver but different um, and we, we had to do it that way because there's just some things you can't do with analog oscillators you know you can't do it, things accurately enough voice to voice Whereas with digital, as we all know, it could be exact as you want it. So um, we could do all of this again with just three of us designing it, and you know, other people working on, you know, mechanical or you know, well, we all work together in all of it. I mean, it's it's kind of fun because uh, we've got a great group with, and everybody's got lots of ideas. Our biggest problem is actually usually stripping down all the ideas into something more cohesive it's because i think other companies have that problem a lot software definitely has that problem because oh all we have to do is add another drop down list here we get 20 features i saw one that it had like 40 filters 50 filters on a drop down list you know who's going to even listen to all of those once much less actually use them whereas ours you have one filter you have one knob and you know it works and it's you can actually use it and figure it out so that's the biggest problem. We, you know, uh, out of our group, everybody's got great ideas, and so that's a great idea by itself. And if you say, should that be in there? The answer would be, well, of course it should be in there. But then, does it really belong? And you know, we have, to, you know, we can't have 450 knobs in the front panel, and we don't want to have menu diving because it's counterproductive. So what do we cut out? So that's actually the hardest part of the design is what to leave out, not what to put in. Um, so that's always an interesting uh, um, concept to get through. I've got a question here from the audience watching on YouTube. Uh, which is Will. So, yeah, Will says, um, in the early days of MIDI, were, were there any conversations about making the controller range wide, wider than 0 to 127? Well, that's another one of those things. You'd be amazed how well 0 to 127 works if you actually interpolate. I mean, you don't have to have <laughs> if you can figure out how to so, go in between the points. So. Uh, you can do whatever you want with MIDI if you use SysX. If you want 16 bits, you want 24 bits, go for it. There's no speed problem now because it's mostly over USB, so just do it. I mean, these restrictions are kind of you know, self-defined. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the spec because then all of a sudden, okay, now it's 24-bit controllers, so now everybody has to start doing 24 bits if they want to or not. And most of them probably wouldn't be implementing it anyhow, they'd just be chopping them off when they come in. So if you want that, and there are cases where you need it, uh, do it. I mean, you know, just you don't have to. But for most people, pitch wheel, mod wheel, hey, yeah, that, that works great. That's seven bits. So that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any other questions? Or? Have you gotten um, any requests from like the all digital Pro Tools of? Plugins for yes. tools and no, no, just <laughs> find the box. Yeah, it's it's kind of to me it's counterproductive. I mean, again, those are some of the things I learned when we did reality. First of all, I hate working under anybody else's OS, and by definition, you're always working under somebody else's OS. So when their OS changes, you have to change. I used to predict that any software synth designed today will not work in ten years. And that's pretty much accurate if you don't update it every time. And you know, some companies have stopped supporting some of their older software, uh, you know, just because at some point it's not worth it. And as a designer, I, I don't want to redesign the same thing every year just so it stays working. I mean, it's it's just everything about it is just uh, not all that interesting to me. And plus, it just ends up being an approximation of the real thing. If you want 
an evolver, buy an evolver. Don't buy a, you know, a plug-in evolver. That's no fun. Now, I know there's a whole lot to be said for being in the box. You know, it works really good for a lot of people. And you know, you get your plug-ins, you get your synths, you get everything, and it's all right there, and you just bring it with you. That's great. And this stuff sounds good too. I don't want to say it doesn't sound good. Just about everything sounds good now. Digital analog software. Uh, I think analog sounds a little bit better. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, stuff sounds good. So if that's the way you want to work, that's great. And a lot of people do want to work that way. It's, the portability is great. It's just, for me, it's just not interesting. And fortunately enough, other people seem to agree. <laughs> but is anybody no. else doing plugins of your? No, no. You know, again, people have done, you know, Arturia has a Prophet 5, Prophet VS, Plug, I don't know if it's a plug-in or pro, standalone program, but uh, you know, but you know, I don't have anything to do with that. They just did it, and you know, if you've never heard a Prophet Five or a VS, it sounds kind of like one. If you put them next to each other, you say, well, okay, they're not quite the same, but you know, if if it's just sitting there, it's probably not a problem. Do you make a conscious effort to avoid uh, proprietary ICs that have a limited lifetime? Yes, we use. I, I don't. I have not used any in the last uh, proprietary. Well, no. I the, we our filter chip is proprietary because we still use a uh, a real Curtis filter chip in all of our products. Curtis, on it's on chip systems, and you know I, I don't. Unfortunately, Doug died about five years ago, but uh, his company on chip is still making the chips for us, and so we've got a you know. Take a chance if something happens, may, we may be in big trouble. Even but SSM, some SSM? SSM stuff is long gone. Uh, that's not, not around at all. A lot of people are built just building discrete versions of some of the old stuff. Uh, so that's, it's not that hard, the information's out there. Uh, but no, we, uh, you know, there was actually a period in the 90s, and that was one of the reasons I didn't do hardware there, where everything was digital, and the only way you could build a new instrument was to do custom chips. And that was just way beyond what one person working by himself could do. But now, of course, we've got digital processors that are plenty fast enough to do anything you want, and they're they're priced reasonably. And you know, so it's you, you can do it again. I mean, that's that's one the other reason I got back into it ten years ago is all of a sudden, oh, I can do it all by myself again. So, um, so it's great to hear you talk. Um, so my question is sort of about. Uh, And one thing I think is really interesting, like in the history of electronic music, was you know in the early days of synthesizers, you could make any sound you could imagine, right? That was like the idea behind the modular, especially. Um, and I remember, and I might be misremembering this, but I remember reading a story many years ago that might be apocryphal about the Prophet Five, and that when they were first coming back for repairs, you know, when music would fail in the field, that the repair techs would look at the at the uh, ROM and they would see that most people hadn't changed any. Right. So people are literally using it like a cafe with keyboard and not making their own sound. And I guess what I'm wondering about is, is that still the case with the instruments you're selling now? Are people still using them sort of like a Casio, but with your sounds, or are they... Uh. I couldn't give you a percentage. I'm sure there's a lot of that because part of the problem now is you know the Prophet Five had 40 sounds. Uh, our products now come with like 400 sounds, and and other keyboards come with even more. So it it could take you a few months just to get through the sounds a single time. It's kind of silly actually. Uh, the nice thing though about an analog synth is even if you don't know what you're doing, you can just grab a knob and see what it does. Not everybody does, and. You know, I've actually heard from some people who say, oh, I, don't, I put the factory presets in before I send it back, so you won't steal them. <laughs> we, 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 we actually heard that back in the Prophet 5 days. I haven't heard that lately, because of course our products never break. Uh, but it's, there, there's just too many sounds. I did hear this one story that was kind of cool. Somebody, uh, a customer had a uh, Poly Evolver keyboard. And he was complaining that his roommate was getting better sounds on it, and his roommate knew absolutely nothing about synthesizers. <laughs> but he would just go up and start turning knobs, and whatever sounded good, he'd kind of follow that path and end up with a sound that sounded really cool. And that's what I tell people. If, if you don't understand synthesizers, you get one of these, and it's got all these great sounds that you can start with. 
And then little by little, however much you want to learn, you just start turning some knobs. And if you say, oh, that sounds really good, you press the right button and you've got, you can keep it. And it's a good way to learn. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if people are still, I, I couldn't tell you what the percentage is, but it was kind of funny back then how, how often. But that gets back to my point earlier that uh, you know, most people just really aren't synthesis. I'm even surprised these days people who are known as being you know, fairly uh, synthesizer players don't always understand what they're doing. You see that a lot of time when you walk up to a synthesizer, they'll visit our office, and they walk up to it and you just watch and see what knobs they turn. And sometimes they turn a knob and you're going, that knob's not going to do anything right now. And it should be fairly obvious, but it's not. Uh, and that's okay, you know, it's, but you know, they can't say, you know, what does this do? They, but generally, you could always turn the cutoff knob and something magical will happen. <laughs> um, I have a question. You said some interesting things about uh, the people you know, a certain kind of disdain for market research and so on. And normally, people in a industrial design and so on would say that the worst thing you want to do is just let an engineer go and do what they want to do. <laughs> and, you know, uh, juxtaposed against that would be sort of the Henry Ford approach, which, which was that, uh, you know, if, I, if, if Henry Ford, if, if he'd done any market research, he would have found out that people just wanted a faster horse. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I'm curious about how your success, because you had this wonderful success, with seemingly eschewing that whole sort of thing and going with your intuition as an engineer and so on. I mean, how do you account for this? Or what, what is your you know, philosophy about that? Well, it's... it's Maybe some of it's luck, and not every instrument I come up with is then well known. But you know, I came into it as somebody who bought a synthesizer to play with. I I didn't buy this and say I'm going to start a company. I'm going to build these someday. I just bought it because it looked like a cool thing to have and it was fun to play with. And you know, the Prophet Five, if you look at it, I mean, probably most of you know it. If it looks like anything, it looks sort of like a mini mode, more so definitely than an Art Odyssey because that's what I started with. Uh, but the other part of it is, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years now, and you kind of get used to, uh, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And, but you still never know. You never know how an instrument's going to sound. You, you, you can plan on, this should sound really good, but until that first time where you get sound coming through, you, you just don't know. And it, it's a fashion statement, too. You don't know. I didn't know that in the last five years, analog synthesizers were going to take off. I was just building instruments that seemed like the right thing to do and fun. But so was I lucky? I, I don't think I was predicting anything. I was just kind of going with the flow. But I do know that when you get too caught up in the marketing thing, it just skews things. I've seen a lot of keyboards from other companies where you look at it and you can just tell that it was committee design because there's oh I could do this this way or this way or this way because three different people had a way of doing it and they all had to get in the machine. Uh, and it's the same reason when we come out with an instrument, we don't show it to people ahead of time and ask them opinions. We just, we just go for it and, and throw it out there. We're going to do that in about a month. We're going to announce a new instrument and we're going to hope everybody likes it and then we'll find out. But will they? I don't know. Do you really want to use ability studies or anything like that? Nah. <laughs> See, well, that's, that's another, I didn't get into this much. When I started my, this company, and it was just me for five years, the first thing you learn is how to be incredibly efficient. And the only thing that mattered in everything that went on was time efficiency. There'd be times, I mean, since I was doing the hardware and the software, you know, I, I was doing everything, so I, I'd be designing something. I'd say, well, I could save $5 if I use this part, but it'll take me three days. Eh, not going to do it. And, but then the other side is, like, oh, I could add this feature in software and save a dollar here, and it'll only take me 10 minutes. Bang. You just do it. And when you, when you have complete control like that, it, it's much faster than doing it. But it had to be faster, because I was also doing service, and I was doing accounting, and I was doing sales. And I, so I, you know, it had to be efficient. And we still keep that philosophy now in the company. You know, we're, we're very efficient. We just dig in and do stuff, and I get in trouble for it sometimes because the guys know at some point I'm just going to say, okay, no more talking about it. We're doing it, and this is what we're going to do. And they go, but wait, we, we thought we'd have more time because we always have, you know, you have all these great ideas for this next product, and of course, a third of them just get tossed at some point because it's time to actually get something done. So it's, it's more fun that way because then we can build more instruments too instead of taking three years. I mean, our, our typical instruments take you know, less than a year, I think, to start to finish, um, depending on the product. Some are quicker, some are slower, but, you know, if it's a Tempest, it was much slower. 
<laughs> I think good forever. But, Can you talk about some earlier projects or ideas that didn't see the light of day? That didn't see the light of day. Mm. Uh, well, that's hard to talk about because some of them may still uh, see you. Yeah. <laughs> that always happens. I mean, obviously, the last couple of months we're already talking about our next projects because once the this upcoming product, you know, it's pretty far along, and you know, we've got fully working prototypes, and we're just finishing up voicing, and um, you know, it's last minute software testing and all that, writing manuals, the usual stuff that you always put off to the end. Uh, so while we're doing all that, we're already talking about our new stuff. And there are some perennial projects that come up each time and then somehow, oh, this is the time to do it, the roller side of things. Right. Which is why in the Tempest, you know, I kind of did the sound part of it and Roger did the, the UI part of it, which made sense. Um, so, uh, but you know, it's in some ways, we, we're always kind of disappointed at how little is going on in a lot of areas. I do like all the, the real cheap cork stuff. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. I mean, it's, it sounds good, it doesn't do much, but it's really cheap and they're fun to play with. And I, I, fun and cheap and sounds good is a good combination. You know, it's not necessarily a pro thing, but anything that gets people into the whole idea of synthesis is good. Um, but on a more pro level, uh, I don't know, there's not, not a whole lot going on. Are there any specific artists whose sort of sound design needs you frequently try to address or include? Uh, no, in it's design? the same thing. We mm -hmm. uh, we designed what we we're doing. This last keyboard, you know, Andrew actually did take it down to LA a month ago and showed it to a handful of people just to, just for fun. And we didn't change anything based on what they said, and they all seemed to like it, so that was good. Uh, but no, we you know we we tend to hear after the fact. Um, you know, people don't always know what to ask for. If you ask them, what should I build next, they'll kind of go, you know, unless it's, well, one of these with more voices, or, what, you know, it's, it's hard for them to know what's possible technology-wise, so, but we do know what's possible, so we can do that. And then once it's out there, they can go say, well, could we add this feature? Okay. It's really easy to add features. I mean, it's really easy to ask to add features, and we try not to go down that path too much, because otherwise a lot of them end up, well, if you hold this button and turn this knob, then you get this new feature. And, I try to avoid those sort of things as much as I can. Well, my all-time favorite sense was your T8. Do you have a story about the pros and cons of polyphonic aftertouch? Uh, well, <laughs> I have a story on that keyboard. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it. It took this is a wood keyboard, and it actually had a flying hammer. And that's so you hit the key and it hit the flight of uh, the hand, uh, this little piece of wood that was, that was weighted and had, and then we sensed velocity optically. It had a little flag on the back that would go between the sensors, and that's how we sensed velocity. So it's pretty high tech. And then, had, like I said, polyphonic pressure. But the problem was it took us seven to eight hours to regulate each keyboard because we had to adjust all of that stuff just right. And it's wood, so it's not going to be the same day to day. And so it, it was a lot of work. Uh, and the polyphonic pressure thing, of course, everybody wants it, and they should. Uh, we're not going to do it unless a keyboard manufacturer provides it for us, because we're not going to get into building little mechanical plastic things. Uh, that's not, I've never been much of a mechanical designer, so uh, you know, if Fatar, if somebody out there came out with a uh, keyboard that they sold, I bet a bunch of people would have polyphonic aftertouch because it's you know software wise it's nothing and the, the sensors aren't even that bad but uh, I try to avoid the, uh, the mechanical side of things but uh, you know the T8 keyboard people still love it even now and you know we, uh, some of you probably know we actually OEM the keyboard to uh, New England Digital to put in their products because they, they also liked it because it was just so refined there was you know nothing quite else like it but uh, not this time around I also like things that are small and lightweight, because maybe because I'm getting old, easier to carry. A bunch of questions from online. Maybe you can cover that in your previous response. But some uh, DSL synth is asking um, alternate controllers such as the Eigen Heart instrument and sound play, sound play need no per channels modes for full expressiveness. Um, the question is, any plans to support that in DSI products? Oh, I think we already respond to polyphonic pressure. Um, and beyond that, uh, uh, probably not. 
immediately. You know, it's the alternate controller market is, uh, you know, for stuff like that, it's, it's compared to what we do, it's just not a good use of our very limited uh, development time. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you could already do just straight on. Uh, and then, you know, something like the Tetra, it's, you know, multi tambral has four independent channels, so you could do things directly on that. And I know some of those, uh, some of those people are working with that for that reason. More? More, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, I know that I'm going to use up any people who actually come through. Uh, Brilla, Brilla asks, um, well, what do you think is your biggest competitor? Are there any new analog synths from other companies that you like? Uh, well, it gets back to my comment about not. I haven't actually sat down oh, yeah, and played fine. with any of them in detail, but again, it, until somebody starts, you know, most of our business is polyphonic uh, analog synths, and like I said, except for Electron, nobody else is really doing that. Uh, so, you know, we keep waiting, but it, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so, we, and you know, we do sell monophonic instruments, but you know, it's a smaller part of our business, because like I said earlier, everybody and their brother makes them now. So if you were going to build a monophonic now, you know, it, it would really have to stand out uh, and be something special, so. Yeah. Uh, Justin asks, is, uh, are you guys planning any move into the Euro rack modular market? <laughs> you know, someday we've got to do that. <laughs> if, Carson, if Carson will have his way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, well, it's, again, one of those things we always talk about, and, you know, stranger things have happened, put it that way. Other questions in the room? Uh, yeah, more of a comment. I guess it, it, um, it seems like you strike a good balance between doing things that sound good and still kind of tracking some of the, I guess, the retro appeal kind of thing. I mean, you know what? I, I come from recording, so it seems like anytime you talk about analog or hardware, people immediately think of like, you know, four, four unit rack things with tubes floating in the middle of it, that kind of thing. It's um, not that analog. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I love that kind of stuff, right? But, uh, um, I guess when you say that your your main draw are, are people looking, looking at your stuff uh, as replacements for retro appeal, or just because it's a new thing that sounds cool still? I think it's both. You know what a lot of recording musicians tell me is that our synths they say they fit better in the mix than digital does, uh, and you know I couldn't possibly try to define why that is, except that it's it's a good thing to say. Uh, but there's something about analog, it, you, as you know, in an analog synth, every voice is a different set of circuitry physically. I mean, it's a whole different set of circuitry, and that's why they cost more. If you open up a Prophet 12, you'll see 12 things in a row, uh, because there's 12 sets of everything. Uh, and when you do it that way, there's always going to be imperfections and differences voice to voice. I mean, I always used to say that analog designers spend all their time trying to get all the voices to line up as perfectly as possible, and digital designers try to get all their voices to misalign as much as possible. Because, <laughs> you know, digital's too perfect, analog it can be too sloppy, but we actually have calibration <laughs> software that goes through and tunes the filters so that they match and stuff, and that's why there's a lot more technology in a polyphonic instrument than there is in a monophonic. Because in monophonic, it doesn't matter. You don't have to match anything. Polyphonic, the voices really do have to sound kind of <clears throat> close. But even if they sound close, I mean, you hit, the, the key 12 times, it's going to sound pretty much the same, but there's always enough differences that when you are playing chords, playing, you know, real music on it, it just, there's something about the richness that's hard to define uh, that I, th I think is still valid. So. Anything else? Other tangents? Anything else? <laughs> Stuart, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. carry this forward just a little bit further, just seeing who's in here right now. So generally we go down the hill to the Treasurer Student Union and pick up some food and some drinks. So uh, try to convince Dave to come down there with us. If you don't know where that is, just follow the gaggle and I'm sure we'll get you down there or pull someone aside that you recognize from Karma who can, can take you there. Thanks again.